you for uh, reminding us of uh, his grace and his power to take care of us. All righty, well, we're going to jump into the Word, and so if you have your Bible, please take it out, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and uh, we'll, the Lord willing, finish out our study of the Thessalonians. Hard to believe, uh, but uh, yes, we've come to the end of both of these books. It's been quite a fascinating study. We've seen a lot of interesting things, haven't we? Uh, we've seen some Bible prophecy in here, talking about the, the return of Jesus, the rapture, the, uh, the man of sin, the Antichrist, and all of those things. And then we've seen some very practical stuff. Uh, you recall in the, in the last part of chapter 5 of, of 1 Thessalonians, Really, really practical bullet points of truth for us. And, uh, and now here, as we're in 2 Thessalonians and wrapping it up here in chapter 3, uh, the Apostle Paul kind of is getting down to business, taking care of some business that needs to be addressed. And uh, we saw that last time. And today, as we finish the letter now, this kind of completes the thought uh, of what he was sharing last time about uh, how to help and, and really discipline others that were walking disorderly. And, uh, and so we see the, uh, the completion of that thought and then the, the closing of the book here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, I'll start in verse 13 and I'll read down through the end of the chapter. The Bible says this in verse 13, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Father, we pray now in these moments that you would guide our thinking, help us to understand what's before us here. And I pray that you would take your divine words and by your Holy Spirit apply them to our hearts and our minds, enlighten our eyes to the truth, and, and enable us to glean from your scriptures the truth that we need today. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do a work in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, last time we we're talking about this uh, incredible topic, this sin that the Apostle Paul was addressing in very serious terms. Uh, and to us, it would almost seem like, ah, this doesn't matter so much. Why is he making such a big deal of it? But it was a big deal. Uh, those that were walking disorderly, and in this case, that disorderly walk was, uh, was choosing to, uh, to be lazy rather than busy doing what God wanted and specifically working. Uh, and so this was a violation of the gospel itself, and it was a very serious deal. And so the Apostle Paul, having addressed it uh, in a, in a uh, small way in his first letter, now writes his second letter, evidently the problem had not been taken care of, and so now he comes on a little bit stronger, quite a bit stronger, uh, with his uh, letter here concerning this topic. And so as we, uh, as we get the uh, context there, uh, just uh, back up a little bit from, uh, to verse 11, where we see this topic uh, and, uh, and how Paul finishes it out. In verse 11 he says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. I know that sometimes uh, when we look around and see what others are doing or not doing, we may have the tendency uh, to to uh, get a little disenfranchised, get a little upset and think it's not right that I'm doing something and they're not doing anything. 
Uh, I don't know if this ever happens with kids, but I know in my family, when I was growing up, uh, it seemed like my sister never did anything. But I had to do all the chores and all the work. I mean, that's just the way it was. The baby of the family is that way, right? <laughs> okay, maybe not. Maybe that didn't happen in your family. Everybody's looking at the baby of the family right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes we start to feel like, hey, it's not fair. It's not right. How comes I have to do all these things and, uh, and, and my sibling doesn't or whoever it is? Uh, and I'll, I'll say this. Even in our society today, I mean, it... We could think of our own, our own country, our own nation, and, and perhaps we might have a, uh, a tendency to look around and say, well, how come these other people aren't working? They ought to be working, and, and here I am working, and, and through taxes, I'm paying for them. You know, what's going on? And it doesn't seem right, doesn't seem fair. And, uh, and we know that, that those feelings can come on. Now, this isn't a discussion of what's right and what's not right, but what we're addressing here is our response. And the Apostle Paul says this, be not weary in well-doing. Just because it seems unfair and just because it seems that others may be getting away with something does not mean that you and I have a license to disobey God and follow some disorderly lifestyle and refuse to do what we know God wants us to do. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Joel, but still, but they're not. <laughs> no, 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 stop. It's not about that. It's not about them. It's about how you and I are responding to the clear call and, and divine enabling that God has given to us to do the work that he's called us to do. He has expectations for us. And so the Apostle Paul, in this context, seems to say, hey, don't be weary in well-doing. There are things that you need to do. There are ministries that you have. There are jobs that you must work. There is obligations that you have to fulfill. And God has these expectations for you. Don't be weary in well-doing. Well, it may be that today you're feeling a little weary. You know, even Cody was sharing a little bit before his song how he, boy, he just needed to kind of uh, look back to the Lord again and get that strength again because it was a tough week. It's a tough weekend. And maybe for you it's been a hard week, a challenging week. Things have happened that you didn't anticipate. Or maybe you anticipated it all along, but it's still just as weary. And it wears you out. You think, well, I just don't know if I can keep going. I'm tired. I just want to go to bed, <laughs> you know. But, you know, we need to encourage ourselves and realize that God has called us and given us purpose. And the purpose comes with the work that God has called us to do. Now, we might have a tendency to think, yeah, you know, all this is because of Adam and Eve and, and their sin. You know, they ate the fruit, and thanks to them, we got to do all this work. You know, and, and God told uh, Adam, in the sweat of your brow, you know, and it's going to be hard and all of this stuff. I want you to know that Adam had work to do before the curse. Adam had a purpose given him by God, and it involved work. And work is not the curse. I mean, you and I would like to think of it as a curse. Oh, I got to go to work again. I don't want to do this, you know. And we think of work as a curse. No, friend. Work is the divine purpose that God has given to you. And so your rejection of work is your rejection of a purpose that God has, in, has entrusted you with. God's given you a job to do, and your very purpose is to do that job and to give Him glory in so doing. And so don't confuse the difficulty of the work uh, as, as the, uh, the, the, cur the, the curse. Don't confuse that with the actual responsibility that God has given to you that he gave to Adam long before, uh, the, uh, or not long before, but I don't, we don't know how long actually, but, uh, but that God gave to Adam before they sinned. So God gives Adam this responsibility, but then the curse uh, comes the curse is that it's not going to be easy but here's the here's the neat thing 
in Jesus, the curse is actually reversed. Have you thought of that? Jesus makes a difference. You try to work your job and do the responsibilities and have the ministries and all that stuff, and you try to do it in your own and on your own, you're going to struggle with it. It's going to be hard. But listen to the words of Jesus when He says, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, Take My yoke upon you and learn of Me, for My yoke is easy and My burden is is light. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can actually see renewed strength, renewed energy to do the tasks that God asks us to do. And yes, while we live in this sinful world and our bodies are wearing out and it may be hard to do, we can rest assured that through Jesus Christ, we will be able to accomplish what he calls us to do. In fact, that's what the apostle Paul says to the Philippians when he says, I can do All things through Christ who strengthens me. It is through Jesus Christ that we have the abilities to do the work that he's called us to do. And so the apostle here says in this letter to the Thessalonians, do not be weary. Be not weary in well-doing. Be not weary in well-doing. It's hard not to be weary sometimes, but there's a way through it. I want you to look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll come back to 2 Thessalonians in a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul addresses this issue of being weary and shows us the solution, the way through it. In verse 1, he says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. He says, we're not going to be weary in this ministry that God has given to us. The Apostle Paul, writing this letter uh, to Corinth, uh, he had gone through a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulties, but he says, you know, we're not going to be weary. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep doing it. But he tells us how this happens down in verse 1. 16, Uh, well, let me start in verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving uh, of many redound to the glory of God. Okay, we see a couple of purposes here. First, Paul is doing the work as a ministry for the sake of others. And it is so that they might receive grace so that they might give God thanksgiving, so that God might receive glory. See, there's a big purpose in his ministry, in his job that God has given to him. Now verse 16, for which cause we faint not. We're not wearing out here. We're not being weary in this. We faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Isn't that good? Though the outward man perish. And of course, we all can understand that. We say, yeah, I agree with that, Pastor Joel. My outward man is wearing out. I'm perishing. I'm getting closer to death with every step. Ah, you know, and we feel it. But we can continue doing the ministry God has called us to and the work that God has called us to as we are renewed in the inner man day by day. Now, how does that happen? through a dynamic, real relationship with Jesus Christ. And as you walk with Him in fellowship, with a dynamic relationship, reading His Word, spending time in prayer, and just walking steps, repeated steps with Him, in fellowship with Him, you will see your inner man renewed day by day. And you'll find yourself having the strength to do what you thought you couldn't. Isn't it amazing when you're serving God, you're in a ministry of some sort, and, and you, at the beginning of the day, I know this happens to me all the time, at the beginning of the day, you, you think, man, I got to do all of this stuff. And honestly, today was one of those days. You know, as, I, as, I, as I got up this morning, I was thinking of all the different things that I have to do today, different meetings and visiting people and the services and getting, every, you know, all of this stuff. And I'm thinking about all of that thinking, boy, 
<laughs> I think I needed a little more rest that last night to, to be able to do this. You know, I'd like to maybe just sleep in a little bit longer. And, and it may be a, a really difficult task that it's ahead of you, but come the end of the day, and this happens every Sunday, come the end of the day, I look back and say, wow, whew, we did it. You know, God was able, and he is always able, to accomplish through us what we yield ourselves to him to do. So he calls us to do something, and no matter how unworthy we may feel or how unable we may feel, we yield ourselves to him. Later on, we're able to look back and say, it's, it's done. It's been accomplished. And you know what? I feel at peace about it, and I have great purpose in my life, and it's okay. I could do it, and I did do it by his strength and by his ability. We find ourselves renewed day by day. And of course, we need that renewing because tomorrow is another long day. Tomorrow, there's a whole lot more that you got to do. And uh, yeah, yeah. And that's why we need this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because he renews us day by day. But if you come to Jesus Christ once a week for that strength, you're going to get worn out real fast. And you're not going to have what you need. And so you need that renewing day by day. All right, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians now, uh, chapter 3. We saw in verse 13, the apostle encourages those that were doing well to continue that and not be weary, even though it may seem unfair. And it might seem like others are getting away with whatever. He says, don't you be weary in well-doing. You keep going do what God wants. Verse 14, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. And, and this verse here, boy, it goes right along with what we saw earlier uh, in this chapter. Look back at verse number six. He says, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. And so again, he repeats this thought in verse 14. If they obey not our word, note that man and have no company with him. Withdraw yourself from him. And, uh, and this doesn't seem like something that we'd like to practice and like to do. It, doesn't, and it almost seems counterproductive because in our minds and in our, in our worldly philosophy, we have this thought. If we really want to do something for God, then we just need to get everybody together and have some unity. You know, enough of these churches bickering and fighting against each other. If we just all got together and did something, well then, wow. But that is a worldly philosophy. That's not from God. In fact, here we see in this passage, God says, you know what, if there is some if there are some that are disorderly, you need to avoid them. And that does, it seems counterproductive to us because we don't recognize where the real power is. You know, we, we would assume that with more people, there's more power. And more unity, there's more power. But that's not where the power is. Where does the power come from? From God himself. The power is in the Holy Spirit. And it's not in some unity that we can manufacture. And so what do we do? We follow the words of Scripture and we seek after God Himself. And in so doing, there may be some occasions where we have to break fellowship in some cases. But we don't like to think about that. But if you're honest with Scripture, you have to. There may be occasions where there has to be some break in the fellowship. And here, that break in fellowship, uh, he is commanding with regard to this epistle. Now, this seems to be because they had been warned and evidently they had followed some kind of process of church discipline. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 18 where you go to that brother alone and then you come back again with another person and then you go back again with a, a few more. And, and, and after these warnings, then it may come to the place where you have to break in fellowship and separate yourself from that individual. And evidently, they were, they were coming to that place uh, in this church discipline. 
If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him. Why? Because he's violating the gospel ministry. He's bringing shame on the name of Jesus Christ. And he's causing damage to the gospel ministry. And so, there needs to be some distance there. So that when other people say, hey, you know, you claim to be a Christian. You claim to be serving God. But look at this person that's, that's mixed right in with you. Look at what they're doing and how they're living their lives and how they're sinning against God. Hey, look at that. And so for that reason, there must be purity in the church and, and there must be that distance. And in this case, it seems church discipline. Note that man. Take note of who the individual is and have no company with him. And what exactly no company means, uh, we can discuss because the verse 15 seems to indicate that there's not a total cutting off because there has to be some way to interact with them to bring them back into fellowship. Okay? And we'll get to that verse in just a moment. But he says here, Note that man, have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Well, his actions were bringing shame to the name of Christ. He needs to experience some shame himself. And of course, this takes us to different places in our thoughts, and we think, oh boy, here we go. The church is out to shame people, you know. Uh, and that's what's wrong with the church today. People go to church and then they, they feel embarrassed and shamed and whatever, and they never want to come back. Our God is a holy God. And I'll tell you this, in God's presence, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. And so are you in His presence. You're ashamed of who you are. You're ashamed of your sin. And through that shame can come repentance. Repentance. Why would you repent? Why would you turn from sin if you never felt embarrassed and ashamed about your sin? And perhaps that's one of, the, one of the problems that we see in our society today where rather than feeling the shame of sin, we display it for all to see and take pride in it. Yes, I'm talking about homosexuality as well. In fact, instead of feeling the shame of that, we make pride statements and, and have months that we can, we can display our arrogance instead of feeling the incredible shame. And we would point our fingers and say, yeah, those people. But what about we as Christians? And that's the context here. He's not talking about those that are unsaved, but those that are. And so the reason for church discipline in this case is so that that individual may feel the shame, the shame of their sin, and then may turn back to God in repentance. In Jeremiah 6, we see uh, this process taking place. And let me just look at this quickly, if I can. Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah, here a prophet, sees the incredible wickedness of his people and their shame. And before his God, even though Jeremiah was not taking part in the sin, he felt the shame nonetheless. Chapter 6 of Jeremiah and verse 15. No, verse 14. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. The children of Israel were assuming everything's okay. It's all good. It's all good. No problems here. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. There's peace when there clearly wasn't peace. There wasn't peace with God. There was sin uh, that uh, they had in, in their nation. Verse 15, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. For they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, 
we will not walk therein. Jeremiah points out their problem. They, they weren't going to follow God. They weren't going to walk in the path that he had established because they refused to be ashamed at their sin. They refused to be ashamed. Shame is important when it leads to repentance. Would to God that we would feel the shame of our sins when we get together with God in our, in our closet and when we look at our lives and see the embarrassment of our own sin before a holy God, we ought to feel shame. And it ought to be real. Of course there's shame. We don't want anybody else to know of our sin. We don't want anybody else to experience that, to see what's going on. We think it's a secret. And we think nobody knows. I don't think that's the case. More importantly, God knows. And it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing when we stand before Him and see that sin. Let that shame and embarrassment lead you to repentance, to where you turn away from that sin, which was exactly the case of the Corinthian church. Paul wrote a similar letter to the church at Corinth, and, and uh, he was addressing a sin issue there, a sexual sin issue. And the, the brother who had offended had repented. He had turned, and, and you could tell with his repentance that it was real he had felt the shame he had felt the embarrassment and he turned clearly from his sin and it led him to repentance and so the purpose of of this church discipline this action that a church takes is shame in order to lead to repentance because ultimately the goal is to bring them back into fellowship and so again back in second thessalonians 3 he says, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet, count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. He says, you don't cast him out and, and treat him like he is an enemy of God. Don't, don't count him that way. Yes, he's fallen. But as we could see in Galatians 6, 1, uh, the Apostle Paul writes a similar uh, letter to the Galatians and he says, Brethren, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. He is, he is a part of the body of Christ, though he's not acting like it. And so you distance yourself from him to, to bring about that shame that he might repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order to help him along those lines of bringing him about uh, and 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 causing him to come back, restoring this brother, you need to admonish him. The word admonish is, uh, is to, to instruct or warn. And, uh, and oftentimes we think of it as a, as a counseling, a counseling, taking some time with this individual, giving them specific instruction, even though you must separate from them and, and create some distance from them in, in the worship and with the body of Christ. There must be some time where you address that individual and say, look, here's where we are. Here's what's going on. You're in a situation. You're committing sin. It's time to repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is how you do it. And so we've got to help this individual, help them to turn back to the Lord Jesus, admonish him as a brother, as a brother. You say, well, Pastor Joel, I just, I don't feel like it's my responsibility uh, to talk to other people, you know, about this. I, I, you know what? Hey, uh, you know, maybe you can. You're the pastor, but, you know, I, I'm not going to talk to other people about that kind of stuff. You know, just uh, live and let live, as they say. Uh, well, maybe that's how the world works, but that's not how the church works, friends. Uh, God has brought you to himself and placed you in in the body of Christ, and it is through the body of Christ that God extends a gracious hand of discipline to bring you back to Himself. I can tell you this, I'm thankful for the discipline that my parents gave me. I wasn't at the time. <laughs> you know, there's, there was a drawer where my dad kept the paddle, and, uh, and this drawer had a squeak to it. 
And every time we heard that squeak, it was like, oh, man, and we all took off running. You know, we knew somebody was getting it. It wasn't fun at the time. But I'm thankful. I'm thankful today that my dad disciplined me. I'm thankful for that. And you know what? You have a loving father, the best father there ever was. Better than the father that you've ever had. And that father extends his loving and gracious hand and will discipline. But it's out of his love. And it's by his grace. And it's to bring you back. Bring you back. You say, I don't need that. And I don't want to take part in that. Well, as a, body, as a part of the body of Christ, you are a part of the accountability that God provides. And so ye which are spiritual, as you walk in the Spirit, as you, as you live in the Spirit, as you yield to the Spirit, you will be called on by God to extend a loving and gracious, meek hand to help someone come back. This is admonishing as a brother, admonishing someone as a brother in in Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul says, you are able to do this. And I think it's helpful for us to see this verse. Romans 15, and let's look at verse 13. Romans chapter 15. As a part of the body of Christ, God wants you to help others to come to Him. Even other Christians who seem to be failing and falling... You which are spiritual in meekness, take part in this restoration process, in this discipline process. Romans chapter 15, look at verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. It's the same word, admonish. You are able to admonish one another. And notice that ability comes from what we just read in verse number 13, the power of the Holy Ghost. Yield to God's Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. And God gives you by His Spirit and through His Word the ability, the know-how, the grace to be able to admonish one another. Don't be so uncaring as to allow a brother or sister in Christ continue walking in sin, living in sin. Don't be so uncaring. But yield to God's Holy Spirit and allow God to use you to admonish a brother who is perhaps walking disorderly and distanced from the church. Allow God to use you to bring them back. And so here, back in 2 Thessalonians, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. I pray that God would use this church in that sense, to help other Christians come to, to repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ with their whole lives. Now, Paul finishes his letter, and he says in verse 16, Now the, the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. I think that's fitting as a conclusion to this topic especially, because it would seem the harshness of discipline, the harshness of admonishing others who are in sin, could cause great divisions and turmoil within the church. But we trust the Lord of peace to give peace, because He will. When you do the work of God, the way that God establishes in His Word, you can trust that He will also fulfill His promise to give peace. To give peace. And so we look to God alone. He is the Lord of peace. We don't get peace uh, by trying to manufacture it in some way. By trying to make something happen. 
but the peace comes at the declaration of God Himself. It is by God that we have peace. Peace. You say, boy, we need peace in our world today. Boy, look at this horrible beating and that, uh, that, those police officers and what they did. And, and it's just so bad. And, and then you've got all these demonstrations and things going on. We need peace. And the peace comes from God. Uh, he is, uh, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Look with me at Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45 and of course, we're reminded of Isaiah 9, where Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. But in Isaiah 45, uh, we see clearly where peace comes from. And I just want to draw your attention to this passage. Verse 40, I'm sorry, verse 5 in Isaiah 45. We need peace. Okay. Verse 5. I am the Lord. There is none else, there is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Wow. Boy, we just need to, to get away from you know, all the turmoil that's happening. We've got to do something about it. You know, from this passage, it seems to indicate that perhaps some of that turmoil is by the design of God. Even to bring about Repentance. But we do know this for sure, that peace only comes from God. He's the one that makes it. He's the one that creates it. He's the one that does it. You say, Pastor Joel, I need peace in my home. I need peace in my marriage. I need peace in my workplace. I need peace in my relationships. Pastor Joel, I need peace in my heart. Where do you get it? Only from God. And you go around chasing peace in some other way, thinking you're going to find it by changing your circumstance, doing something different. You're not going to find peace there. It only comes by God. And so you need to seek God. Seek Him with your whole heart. Seek Him with everything that you have. You say, I don't have time for that then you don't have time for peace. It's one or the other. Seek Him and find peace. The Apostle Paul says, Now the Lord of peace Himself give you peace always by all means. I like that. Always. I need peace all the time. By all means. However God's going to do it, He's going to give me peace. And it comes from Him alone. The Lord of peace Himself give you peace always by all means. And how does He do it? The Lord be with you all. <laughs> his, his presence, His presence. Jesus promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's where your peace comes from. The world may be caving in on you and everything falling apart, but with Jesus at my side, I have peace. And so it doesn't matter. Everything else doesn't matter. I have peace because I have Jesus. I have Jesus. Paul finishes the letter. Verse 17, the citation of Paul with mine own hand, which is a token in every epistle, so I write. And Paul signs his letter. Evidently, he had used someone else to pen it, to write it for him. And then he uses his own hand to sign the letter, which would be a great encouragement to the Thessalonians, knowing that there were false teachers out there. So Paul signs his letter, and, uh, and he signs all of his letters, evidently, uh, which is what he indicates here in this verse. And then, of course, he wraps up his letter with these words, as he does almost every letter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And what else do you need but God's grace? That is absolutely the best thing that you could wish for anybody, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I need his grace. You need his grace. And so let's wish his grace for others and pass that on. 
uh, to others as we live our lives. Well, let's uh, close our time in prayer here. Father, thank you for helping us as we've studied this, uh, this book of 2 Thessalonians. I thank you for giving us instruction and, and uh, helping us to deal with topics and issues. Lord, I pray that having studied this book, uh, we would draw closer to you in our personal walk. And that, Lord, as we face trials and difficulties, may we have confidence knowing that you will give peace. And Lord, as we think about the end times and the return of Jesus and the, and the horrible judgments to come, Lord, help us to rest in you, the Lord of peace. And Lord, as we see these things happening around us, may we not just settle back and, and just get lazy and just decide to wait till Jesus comes, but may we occupy till he comes. May we be busy about the Father's business. Lord, help us not to be weary in the well-doing that you've called us to. But Lord, I pray that having uh, seen your power by your Spirit in our lives at salvation, we would then turn and continue to serve you by your grace and by your strength. Lord, thank you for what you have done and for what you will do. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.